At this point in our series, we've traced the evolution of life up to the first truly terrestrial tetrapods, the basal amniotes of the Carboniferous. The first part of that geologic period is known as the Mississippian. The rest is the Pennsylvanian, and that's what we're looking at now, 300 million to 320 million years ago. Although this episode will also include changes in some other lineages that occurred later on in the Permian. We'll first look at Cassinaria and Westlothiana. They're basal to Sauropsida and Synapsida, and transitional between them and Amniota. So these are examples of what Amniotes were before they diversified into these other groups. Similarly, the mostly amphibian Simoria morpha and Diadecta morpha were once classed together as Cotylosauria, meaning stem reptiles, but now they're both considered to be too amphibious to be reptilian. Sauropsida essentially means reptile, which is a bit confusing since amniotes are already reptiliomorphs, but not reptiles. And neither are sauropsids, completely. When you look at this cladogram, you might think sauropsids branched into parareptiles, meaning not quite reptiles, and eureptiles, meaning true reptiles, although they're not really true reptiles either, at least not all of them. True reptiles are in one of the subsets of Romerida called Diapsidae, which we'll get to momentarily. As I said, it looks like once you have a division between parareptiles and eureptiles, and apparently sometime after that, eureptiles branched into capturinids and all these other things. But it's not really what it looks like. That's kind of an optical illusion, as many of these relationships are actually much closer than they appear on these charts. Not necessarily always, but sometimes. Because sauropsids really sort of began with capturinidae, formerly known as cotylosaurs. See, in the last episode we had reptile-like amphibians, but these are amphibian-like reptiles, and all of them are transitional species. These cladograms are constructed to assist in our understanding, but how we depict them can be confusing if they're based on conventions of faulty analysis tainted by assumptions. Unfortunately, science works like a game of 20 questions. We know what all the answers were 17 questions in, and so we got a good idea how all this works, and we know what we got right. But the last few questions can still surprise us, and then suddenly everything makes sense. Part of the problem is parareptiles, also known as anapsids. See, in a sense, all these divisions really boil down to the three most important groups. Anapsids, synapsids, and diapsids. Anapsids have a heavy skull with no holes in it other than four nostrils and orbits. Synapsids have an extra hole in the temple area called a temporal fenestra. It's caused by the way individual bones in the skull change sizes as the animals evolve. Differential growth may create gaps or holes in the skull. And diapsids have two holes in their skulls. The presence and number of fenestrae is how all these major amniote divisions have been classified since the early 20th century. But there are problems with that. First, it's not consistent. For example, there's a third group, a polyphyletic group, meaning that it's actually multiple groups that are also classified as having one temporal fenestra, and they're not synapsids. They're diapsid descendants, where one or more of those holes eventually closed up again generations later on. Another example is birds. Birds are a subset of dinosaurs, which themselves are a subset of reptiles. So they're all classified as diapsids, except that dinosaurs added a third pair of fenestra. And subsequent to that, and probably owing to the stresses of flight, bird skulls sutured up those original holes, so they're like anapsids again, except that they still have the third pair of holes from earlier dinosaurs. The other problem is that having no fenestra isn't a proper subset of amniotes. It's the way they all started out. So it's paraphyletic, meaning that daughter groups can grow out of it or back into it. If it's already a primitive trait, then how can we base a subsequent clade on that or tell the daughters apart from the ancestors? We can still use fenestra as part of our classification, but we'd have to treat parareptiles more as a basal group than a sister clade. So they start and maybe continue with no fenestra, or synapsids get one fenestra and that branch continues on to mammals like us. Then diapsids get another one and that's where all the true reptiles are. So our ancestors were once amphibious, but not actually amphibians, and we were once seemingly reptilian, but we were never actually reptiles because we branched off before the emergence of actual reptiles. Now this is where it gets confusing. The real problem is turtles. Where do they really fit into all this? The position of turtles among amniotes is said to be one of the oldest and most contentious problems in vertebrate systematics. Because turtles don't have any fenestra, not even the oldest turtles in the fossil record. Those oldest turtles had teeth, where modern turtles don't, and their shells weren't always complete either, so we know that before turtles had shells, they looked like fat, lazy, lizard-like anapsids, and we have all these fat, sluggish anapsids that look just like what you'd expect turtles to look like if they didn't have a shell. Well, except for mesosaurs. Those were apparently the first amniotes that were adapted to living on dry land, but then readapted to living in the water once again, as many other amniotes have done since. 
How the turtle shell evolved is a topic for another time, and I'll certainly make a video about that after this series is done. But because of this paraphyletic anapsid group, many sources you look up today say that turtles aren't really reptiles, that they're para-reptiles and the sole survivors of this really ancient fossil family. I certainly liked the idea that there was at least one surviving lineage in the modern day, so I was happy when they identified the anapsid Eunotosaurus as the most basal of all turtles. It has very distinct, unique modifications that are only consistent with turtles and imply a definite link with them. Yet some other scientists had initially dismissed Eunotosaurus because they were so certain that turtles had to be reptiles. They had to be diapsids who, you know, sealed those fenestra up later on. Geneticists ran tests, of course, and all of them showed that turtles were actually diapsids, just like they said, but that wasn't enough to convince me. Because all the basal morphological characteristics unique to turtles first appear in Millerosauria, with Eunotosaurus and also its sister species, Milleretta. And there are at least a half dozen clades removed from diapsids. Not that that really matters, because each of these groups are a lot closer than they look in this computerized uniform display. But remember that virtually everything shown here is extinct. Every reptile that's still alive in the whole world is in one of only two groups of diapsids, and most of each of those groups are extinct too. Dinosaurs, pterosaurs, phytosaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and all these other things are gone. All we have left are lizards, snakes, and the adorable tuatara in Lepidosauria, as well as crocodilians and birds in Archosauria. Because everything else in all these other clades are long dead, we don't have their DNA. You can compare the turtle genome to all remaining diapsids, but all any of these tests can tell you is whether turtles are closer to lizards than crocodiles or the other way around. And depending on how those tests are done, both results have recurred. Because we don't have any uncontested parareptiles to show whether turtles are closer to that family tree than they are to either branch of the diapsid tree. So this is one of those rare instances where genetic tests can't solve the problem. In such situations, you need better fossils and closer inspection, which a lot of early scientists couldn't do or didn't do, or they didn't check and correct themselves because they were already so confident that they guessed it right the first time. You know how people are. But as more data comes in, more questions arise, and more study is needed to answer them. What paleontologists have discovered since then is that both Milleretta and Eunotosaurus actually had fenestra, just not as pronounced or noticeable as they are on later diapsids, just sort of opening, as it were. So it turns out that this particular clade should be removed from Parareptilia and should probably be more appropriately nested in Neodiapsidae, with the understanding that Eunotosaurus may be one of the first of the at least partially fenestrated reptiles, but that its descendants obviously reverted back immediately, as some other lineages eventually did also. Humans, for example, no longer have a temporal fenestra either. That hole in our skull closed up quite a long time ago, but you can still see the outline of where it was. So do you accept and understand why you are classified as a synapsid? In our entire phylogeny, this is the only time when we don't still wear the trait that defines our clade. And that's because fenestra don't serve a discernible function, other than making the skull a bit lighter or maybe providing for muscle placement. There's usually no use for it at all. But in our case, we needed to close those windows and protect our most precious organ. So, you need a fenestra like you need another hole in your head.